Hello, everyone, and welcome to the intersection of AI and sustainability. Today's webinar is sponsored by Cyrus One and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Keith Ward. I am with Actual Tech Media, and I'm really thrilled to be your moderator for this timely discussion today. Before we get to the content, though, there are a couple of housekeeping items I need to let you know about that I hope you get the most out of this session. First off, we want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage all of your questions in the questions box in your webinar control panel. Now, at the end of the discussion we're going to have today, we will go over some of those top questions also with our experts. Now, that Q&A panel is also the place to let us know about any technical issues you might be experiencing. If that happens, the first thing you want to do is refresh that browser, which will fix most of those issues. If that doesn't fix it, well, try another browser refresh. If that still doesn't fix it, let us know and we'll get right on it and try to help you out. All right, um, next, in the handout section of that control panel, you'll find some outstanding resources, including three handouts from Cyrus One. Those handouts include PDFs covering the AI impact on data centers and various sustainability issues as it relates to AI. Folks, all of those are free and they're available right now. So check out that handout section and download those resources. There you will also find links to the Gorilla Guide Book Club, which has our library of, our huge library actually, of uh, printed books on technology topics. And there's also a link to the Actual Tech Media Events Center, which has our calendar of upcoming events. If you see something you like that's coming up soon, uh, check it out and sign up today for that. All right. Third, at the end of this event today, we will be giving away a $250 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant. Now, you have to be in attendance during the entire event to qualify for the prize. The official terms and conditions of the prize drawing can be found in the handout section. If you like really boring reading, I would go there right now and check that out. And uh, as I mentioned before, we do encourage your questions as always, and to encourage even more questions, we have a really interesting topic today. We are going to give away an additional Amazon gift card, this one for 50 bucks for the best question that comes in. So at the end of the event, we're gonna gather up all the questions that you ask. We're gonna pick out the very best one, and we're gonna send that winner a $50 Amazon gift card. So keep those questions coming in throughout. And with that, I am going to introduce today's topic. I want to start now by providing a quick overview of what we're going to be discussing. So on today's uh, event, we're going to explore a paradigm shift that's really transforming data center strategy strategies. Traditionally, uh, data centers have been seen as power hungry behemoths, right? But those days are gone. Data centers are changing rapidly. They do more than just IT operations. Now, data centers also have to be operated responsibly with an eye toward preserving our planet. It's not just about processing data anymore. It's about processing data responsibly, being a good citizen. So companies are realizing that to thrive in the long run, they do need to align their strategies with environmental responsibility. In part, this is because companies are recognizing that consumers are more environmentally conscious than ever. So investing in sustainable practices is not only ethical, but it's also a smart business move. Now, this includes AI, which of course can be very power hungry. And more than ever, companies are leveraging the computational power of AI to meet their sustainability objectives without breaking the bank. But AI, of course, does more than just use power. It's a powerful tool for optimizing energy consumption and reducing environmental impact. From predictive maintenance to dynamic workload management, AI is just simply revolutionizing the way data centers operate. Now, that said, businesses do need to invest wisely in AI technologies that align with their sustainability goals. This might involve initial costs, but the long-term benefits are quite substantial. So the end result of all this is that we'll end up with a cleaner environment and a more sustainable world for all of us. Isn't that what we're all looking to do? All right, so that gives you just a little taste of where we're gonna go with this discussion today. So at this point, I want to introduce uh, the two gentlemen that I will be conversing with. 
for the next little while. That is uh, Kyle Myers and Jim Roche. And we're going to have a fun, fascinating roundtable discussion on the issues I've just been talking about. So gentlemen, it looks like you're ready. So why don't we get into it? All right, and so why don't we get going now? We have got Jim and Kyle with us. Thank you, gentlemen, both for joining us today. And let's dive right into this discussion of the intersection of AI and sustainability. So uh, you can see who the three of us are here, uh, Jim and me, that would be Keith and Kyle. And uh, so we have uh, prepared something I think pretty special for you today. As you can see the breakdown here, We've got a number of topics that we're going to be going through, and uh, we've got some really interesting uh, tidbits and insights ahead, I think. So um, I'm not going to go over this entire thing here, but uh, this just gives you a sense of how the flow of the conversation is going to go today. So first up, uh, sustainable practices and circular economy in data centers. Now, that sounds like a pretty complex idea here. So um, can you, can both of you or either of you kind of unpack the idea of, uh, of this title? Sure. So, so Jim, I'll take the first crap at, crack at it. Thankfully we can edit that. Um, <laughs> I'll take the first crack at that. Um, so when we think about the world of sustainability and data centers, there's a couple things to keep in mind. So there's a lot of different topics that we could cover. We thought the ones that would be most relevant would be things around climate, water, biodiversity, and then circularity. We sort of call it our fantastic four uh, within Cyrus One. So one thing to keep in mind is we are a co-location provider. So we do not actually run the IT equipment within in the facilities. We basically have apartments for computers. So we provide power and cooling. So we do not have uh, direct um, responsibility for the actual servers that are running. So there's a lot of relevant metrics uh, that we could talk about today, but the two that we wanted to just tee up on this screen are around measures of energy, which we use P within the industry to measure um, the efficiency of the energy we use. WUE is a water efficiency metric. And then uh, in terms of the carbon footprint, which is directly related to PUE, there's the CUE, which is the, a measure of carbon intensity. Okay. All right, um, Jim, anything to add there? Can you, maybe you can answer this. Why is this becoming such an important issue these days? Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. Over the, over the years of evolution of the data center industry, back in the day, PUE wasn't as big a thing. It was, it was a nice to have um, to, to strive for the efficiency in the data center, but it wasn't talked about nearly as much as it is these days. And, and water, if, if PUE wasn't talked about nearly as much as, as it is today, WUE was even further off. Um, we, we worked in a world for a, a, a number of years where water wasn't a concern. Um, evaporating water to, in, in the form of cooling your data centers um, was just was just a practice that most companies did without issue and and things have changed quite a bit with both it's um you know the education of people that are that are building and designing and buying these data centers they call these things out and and really started embracing i think everybody has started embracing you know the the whole climate change and and what we're looking to do from a carbon footprint in this world noting that you know data centers do draw quite a bit of power and use use quite a bit of energy. So um, it's only natural that when we start talking about things like that, that, um, you know, the data centers get looped in and, and we and we really start getting pressured on the on the PUE, WUE and the CUE. And when we're talking about um, AI, I mean, that kind of ramps up everything, doesn't it? A lot more data being pushed, a lot more computation, which means a lot more resource usage. So what would you say are the promises and benefits of AI, uh, specifically when it comes to data centers, which is, of course, what you focus on? You know, I'll take the first crack at that, Kyle. Um, you know, while it's true, they, they they are very power hungry um, deployments when, when we start talking about AI. The, the amount of density that, that we're starting to see in data centers is, is like nothing that's, that's come before it. And we've always talked about density ramping up over the years. Um, you know, we, 
we started building data centers at 150 watts a square foot. Um, 250 watts a square foot became somewhat of the norm and we started pushing it up. And now we're seeing in excess of 1,000 to 2,000 watts a square foot. And, and a lot of that is AI driven um, because of the, 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 the computational um, resources that this requires and the heat that, uh, and the cooling and, and the electricity, it just all, it's, it's all playing into a world where we really have to focus on design and energy and savings because once you start getting into, in, instead of selling or, or, or buying or using a megawatt, we're talking 100 megawatts. 200 megawatts, a gigawatt worth of power. So all of the all of the efficiencies or inefficiencies um, are glaring. And, and so with the AI workloads, what our focus is, is trying to optimize everything, everything across the board. It's not just electricity and it's not just cooling. What we're trying to optimize using you know, with these AI deployments is every resource that we put into a data center, whether that's concrete, uh, drywall, steel, um, you know, it's the givens that we have that everybody knows, the generators and the and the UPSs, but it's um, it's the natural resources too, copper. Um, you know, the, the resources of copper that we're trying to understand, you know, how we can do things more efficient and, and that's using different, uh, different alloys. Um, so it really, you know, if you really want to dive into AI and how it affects the data center, um, it's really a broad spectrum. Right. Uh, Kyle, what are your thoughts uh, on that? You know, we don't think about some of those things. You know, that, that what you're saying reminds me a little bit of of uh, e vehicles now and how the great the need for certain you know chemicals to certain materials is. Uh, so it kind of sounds like the same thing for AI, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and you know we'll talk about this a little bit later on in the conversation. Well, we'll look at this in a bunch of different ways, but one of the advantages of going higher density is it requires less space per kilowatt or megawatt is the typical measure within the data industry. So if you think about that, um, we get more sort of bang for the buck with doing high density AI type of deployments. And in fact, it takes up to 25% less space compared to a traditional uh, what we would call like a hyperscale or co-location type data center. So there is some upside uh, from a uh, from a biodiversity perspective and from a sustainability perspective, these types of deployments. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, um, higher power density. Now you just uh, brought that up, um, Kyle. So let's, let's talk about that. Why don't you start with a definition of what that is and then we can discuss some of these other points uh, on the slide here. Yeah, and I'm going to kick that one over to Jim in a second. So I'll 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 uh, try to speak a little bit more to the sustainability components, but Jim's going to do a better job at speaking to the, the power density uh, in specific terms. So we'd already mentioned on the previous slide that it takes up less land impact. So one of the the realities when you're deploying real estate, so typically we're going to buy a a plot of land, right? There may be a existing development on it, there may not be, but anytime you're putting down concrete and steel or building on property, there's a potential to have a negative impact on the biodiversity or the ecology or, or the nature of that area. One of the things that we're able to do less is less bad impact by taking up less square footage for being able to use the same amount of compute power. So the, the translation from more power density to sustainability is typically a good one when it applies to the amount of, uh, again, space, which impacts biodiversity, impacts circularity, and also um, impacts uh, other things like the, the, the carbon density when we're able to move to renewable, uh, renewable power on top of those other um, considerations. Okay, Jim? Yeah, there's a couple of factors when we're starting to look at, at the, these high power density uh, deployments. Um, one is with the equipment in a data center, it, it works most efficiently when it's at or above the 50% utilization mark. So, you know, one of the things that, that these densities um, allow us to do is, is really drive the equipment. And, and by equipment, I mean the UPSs and the, and the chillers and the craze um, to a point where they're, they're in a sweet spot of, of efficiency. Um, I think that's probably one of the, the biggest advantages um, when we start looking at this is, you know, the, 
when you get most data centers and it, and it really has been tough over the years trying to get people to to create a an environment that was where, where density was increasing you, you wanted them to push it but it, it to Kyle's earlier point we don't control what goes into the data center from a cat in a cabinet sense we build and design the data centers to be pushed to a certain level the the reality is many customers don't get to those levels they don't get to the 50 plus the 60 plus the 70 plus percent of of utilization and and that really really plays a, a role in inefficiency in in data centers and and so the the other thing that takes a the, the really contributes to efficiency in the data center, specifically on the cooling side of the house is these higher uh, density deployments are to a point where air really, you can't just fight it with air. You can't, you can't do heat rejection using just air. So now you're, you're introducing water into a lot of these environments and in, in the form of, you know, a, a DLC or liquid to chip um, rear door heat exchangers, um, you're even seeing, you know, at a smaller level, some immersion technology. Um, so what that allows is the, the, the cooling efficiency goes through the roof um, when we're starting to introduce liquid. So you can get a super high density uh, deployment that might be a cabinet of, you know, 50 to 100 kW rack using liquid, and you're able to utilize the cooling at a much greater um, uh, percentage. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about, and I just want to make sure that I'm understanding you correctly. You're, you're talking about just physical density in terms of efficiency. What I was thinking of initially when you talked um, was virtualization and how that increased efficiency of servers, because now you could have multiple virtual servers on, you know, on one server, right, on one physical piece of hardware. But you're talking about something just strictly physical here? Yeah. So... Doing the virtual side of it, yeah. Any anytime you can, anytime you can take um, a bunch of components and and merge them into a single component in the data center is is tends to be a much more efficient play, um, both from a footprint standpoint and and from an energy efficiency standpoint. You know the the problem or the rub with with being a co-location provider or a provider to even a single tenant. Um, we we don't have that optionality. We don't drive those choices with the customers. So we could build the most efficient cooling and electrical uh, systems on the planet, but it, it's a partnership between um, what we build and design and what the customer is putting into the data center. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so AI is, it's been around a little while, but in terms, I think of the, the heavy use of it and the heavy, more commercial use, uh, it's really pretty new stuff. And that is gonna lead to big changes. And uh, th there's gonna be a lot of concern about th the topic that's up there now, upgrading what you've got versus building you know, from scratch. Um, and so let's talk about some of those concerns uh, in that regard. So I'll, I'll start with that. It's, you know, Building what you got, it, it's funny. If you look back, the inefficiency, in a sense, that the inefficiencies of, of the older data centers are actually lending to being um, a, a gateway to the efficiencies of the AI or, or of the high density data centers. And I'll explain why. Um, as we went through, like when we talked about how many watts per square foot we were designing towards, and, and back in the day when we were talking 150 to 250 watts a square foot that we were designing towards, we would take, for example, take a, a 60,000 square foot data hall or a 50,000 square foot data hall, put nine megawatts in it, and that was great. It, you know, it met um, the needs of, of virtually everybody um, that was consuming it. And, and so that's on the inside of the building. When you're talking about how AI gets um, or high density deployments can, can merge into the, you know, a retrofit of, of an older data center, that the size actually works out, being a little bit bigger actually works out in our favor because what happens is, you know, it's not so much the space inside that we need because we're growing, you know, this density is growing. So everything inside is shrinking and that's fine. But what we have to have at some point 
is what you got to think about the stuff that sits outside of the data centers, which is the generators, the chillers in our in our world of Cyrus One uh, modular UPS units. Those are sitting outside the data center. And at some point you have to have land to put those on. So you could shrink these buildings and make two, 3,000 uh, watt per square foot buildings. And the building is going to be this big. The problem is I have a yard that I need for, for generators and chillers and whatnot that is this big or roof space for chillers that you need to, that surpasses the size of the data center. So when we start looking at, you know, people that want to retrofit a data center, although it's not simple, it's, it's very intrusive. Um, the, the size of the older or gosh, we're getting to a point where we're calling them, you know, even, even 150 watts a square foot, we're calling those legacy data centers. We're getting to a point where those, um, those might be actually really beneficial in the retrofit world. Interesting. Um, Kyle, do you want to speak to this? Um, I would just mention one, one thing, and, and we're going to speak about this a bit more on the next, um, on the next uh, slide, but, you know, one consideration with, being able to locate the data center. So a new building versus an existing building is, if you think about kind of the two primary components of AI, one of which is the, the training component um, and the other is the inference component, right? So you, you, you train like a large learning, language learning model uh, over just hordes of data. And then you can use that like a chat GPT, which is the inference piece. The training can typically be done anywhere and so this gives us an enormous amount of flexibility when you think about it from a siting perspective. So we're not limited to typical availability zones in all cases. So we could go to some place like, I don't know, Norway, where they have 100% renewable energy. It's a cooler climate. There's lots of benefits. We could go somewhere where biodiversity impact isn't such a concern, um, where there's district heating systems. All of these things suddenly become possible with the, depending on the type of, uh, computations that the data center deployment's doing. So that's kind of a neat uh, lever that you can pull that AI lends itself to, at least when you're doing new siting. Right, right. Okay, um, you mentioned the next slide. So let's dive into that. Uh, <laughs> these these titles are, are really interesting. Um, AI adaptation strategies combined with climate resilience. So why is this an important uh, combination here? Yeah, so when we think about sustainability from the data center industry, we think about it in like two different ways, right? How we impact the environment, so carbon footprint and those sorts of things versus how the uh, environment impacts us. That's where the climate resistance piece comes in. So when we're looking at siting, there's a whole bunch of considerations, but when you start taking into consideration access, renewable energy, water availability, if you're using that for cooling or other purposes with the data center, again, biodiversity impact, is there gonna be a negative one, positive one, can you recondition uh, like a brownfield site? And then the circularity piece is particularly interesting. You hear a lot about district heating systems. Well, you need access to a district heating system uh, system as well as population density typically to make sure to make that line out. So those things suddenly become much more possible um, to site in areas that are conducive to those types of things. On the resilient side, um, like one of the interesting features of our base design is it does not require water for cooling. So think about a, a place like the desert in Phoenix, for example, where we have a large campus. If you're dependent on water for cooling, and there's, it's considered a very high stress water region, the water becomes less available, that impacts your potential resilience. So you can take those considerations in if you're gonna have to, or you choose to use water towers or some kind of evaporative cooling as part of your, um, as part of your cooling technology, you, that's better suited for an area where water is plentiful. And it's also, um, you can also make cho choices based on just the economics of where you site things. Right, right. Okay, um, let's uh, let's get to the second part of this. Um, so some more points to make here. Uh, Jim, did you want to jump in, or Kyle, did you want to uh, did you want to continue on? Oh, I think the climate guy should keep going. <laughs> <laughs> that would be Kyle. <laughs> yeah, you know. So the, the 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 next consideration, you know, moving past siting is so how could we leverage AI within, you know, a sustainability um, sense or even within the data center industry. So I'll, I'll, I'll jump on a question that Jim can probably expand on or answer better than me, but 
one of the technologies a lot of data centers are looking at um, these uh, AI is really good at predictive modeling, right? And so as you're monitoring um, temperatures or fan speeds within the data center floor, AI has capabilities and been able to monitor more and, and more quickly be able to predict anomalies such as the temperature rising too high that might impact equipment or the fact that we're not running at peak efficiency for fan speeds and then either automatically adjust things, which I know you know, a lot of our ops guys are a little bit leery about because they're worried about downtime or at least bring it to a human's attention. Within the sustainability world, we can use AI and, you know, a subtopic of machine learning on anything from like uh, weather modeling, which is super important as climate change continues, continues to upset weather patterns. The old, the old patterns don't mean as much as they used to. We have to be able to predict based on uh, changing conditions. Or even simple things like we use a machine learning tool to scan utility invoices. So it's important to get good data to make sure that you can make good decisions. Well, you might imagine when you're operating at a global scale like we are, we get a lot of these things and it's difficult uh, to make sure you're QA and QC in them. So we use AI just to scan all those things and look for anomalies that we can bring to humans' attention to see if there's an issue. So those are kind of two basic examples where we might deploy AI for tools within the data centers. Okay. You said you might have a question for Jim here to tackle. Well, I, I, I was going to tee up the uh, additional <laughs> uses that the engineering or ops team might be um, considering when it comes to deploying AI. That's just one that I'd heard about from ops. Yeah, it's, it. you know, I think what we're all learning is, is that you know, AI is providing insight into a lot of different things that we either take in in the past took us a long time to digest and 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 figure now it's it's done in in the matter of minutes or seconds and and i think when we look at how the environment is reacting and i'm and i'm speaking to both interior and exterior of the building we, you know we do use these types of platforms that um that can do predictive um, failures and 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 look at equipment. We can we can simulate all kinds of of things in the data center to to see where um, where there might be holes in it, if you will, um, and where where we might you know need more focus on air and and how things can operate a little bit better. And and what the the intelligence of the actual pieces of equipment that are going into the data centers, not the Cyrus One, but from a customer standpoint, their ability to to ramp up or shed load or drive um, drive some of this stuff at times that might not be peak energy, right? So that they can drive things down, they can save money on their own by it. So, so it's actually an intelligent system within the data center that's, that's allowing um, their equipment to run more efficient, efficiently while using less electricity. Um, and I think that's one of the keys that, it, that is coming out of this as well. And it, it's so early, in these in this world of 100 to 200 we've we, you know cyrus one just recently deployed or designed a, a deployment for 300 watts um 300 kw for per cabinet which is is something you, you know if you think of the world of density right now across you know i'll just use the united states as an example if you look at you know we're talking about we're just throwing the numbers around like 50 kW a rack, 100 kW, 300 kW rack. We, you know, and the reality of it is, is if you looked across the port, everybody's portfolio in the United States, it's the average cabinet is sub 5 kW per rack. So the, when we're talking about these other densities, it's, it's not only a stretch, it's, it's way out there as far as the, the type of power and heat um, rejection that we're, that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about um, about the issues here. Um, you've you guys have, have set up the problem uh, beautifully and explained it very clearly. So let's talk a little bit about the one of the solutions here and and Cyrus One's part of that solution. Um, let's talk a little bit about IntelliScale and and what that means and how that can be uh, can be used. I can Either one. <laughs> Jim, <laughs> your baby. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, so truth be told, you know, we we love plugging this these two letters into everything. AI. Um, actually, Intelliscale is 
has been a design that that we've been tweaking and and testing and and playing around with, if you will, for um, the better part of three years. Um, it it's recently kicked up quite a bit because, like I had mentioned, if if you're trying to build a data center for 12 kW rack, which is reality. Um, and you have to pivot to 300 kW per rack, it's it's a whole nother world. So, you know, when we started looking at some of this stuff um, and the design and, and what we are calling IntelliScale, um, it, it was stretching the boundaries of a lot of different things. The, the getting electricity, you know, just getting electricity, that kind of power to a single building um, in, the, in terms of, you know, where we would, we would typically do, um, you know, a few hundred thousand square feet for a building, we were, we we're shrinking that down with the same amount of power and, and being able to handle the cooling side of it. So what, what really is driving um, the efficiencies and Kyle kind of touched on it earlier is everything, you know, land, um, land is becoming a really big thing too. I mean, we, I mean, we talk about all kinds of, of things like power and, and, and cooling and water and, um, you know, carbon in general, but being able to do this on a much smaller parcel of land allows the us the ability or anybody the ability to plant trees, have parks. You know, it doesn't have to be a two million. Literally, we have two million square foot campuses of of data centers. Well, if you could shrink that down, and and be able to achieve some of this stuff like we're talking about. Um, in, in, in IntelliScale, then you're saving a, a whole lot of land that can be used for other things. And I, I think that's equally as important. It's always great to be using less less drywall, less steel, less, um, I mean, probably not using a whole lot less copper, but um, any other raw materials. Uh, it, it's always good to, to, to do that. But some of the things that get lost in all, is, is all of these other things like land. Um, so we, we hold that very near and dear, you know, the, the ability to plant X amount of more trees by using an IntelliScale design. Um, I, and I think that's super important. So, um, Kyle, this is, there is, you know, we love buzzwords, right, in this industry. And one of them that we love is game changer. But um, from, what, from what we've been talking about, in your opinion, could IntelliScale really be a game changer for sustainability going forward? Is this a model that that maybe we should be looking at? Yeah, you know, I think so for, for two different reasons. So, so Jim had, had already sort of mentioned, you know, the, the smaller footprint. So just uh, we did some modeling math, like the average IntelliScale deployment uses 50% less concrete. And we all know that concrete and steel are two of the hardest materials to take the embody carbon out of. So just out of the gate, that's sort of a massive victory for us. 79% less generators for, for backup. Um, and, and Jim could explain exactly how that one works in terms of uh, how we do our configurations. And there's a bunch more numbers we throw at this, but it's just plain old resource intensive that makes uh, solving for environmental footprint or offsetting things that much easier. And then to just go back to the, the point that we made a little bit earlier in the discussion today, um, another benefit to the siting flexibility. So whether you site in, I don't know, Northern Virginia or Michigan, the same deployment is going to consume the same resources, right? But when you think about concentration of resources, the problem with all data centers going to one particular area is it just concentrates those needs for power, water, and other um but other types of uh, uh, consumables. And so if you're able to kind of spread that out and again, um, cite things uh, that are located in places where those are plentiful or where they don't need to build more power plants for you to cite, you could cite next to, a, I don't know, underutilized new plants or obviously renewables are what would be um, preferable. Like West Texas is covered in solar arrays and wind farms. I mean, that is truly a game changer. But one of the biggest problems with renewable power now is to get the power to where it's being consumed, right? The solar arrays are not in metro areas. They tend to be far away. So if you can go to where the power and the resources are, that's absolutely a game changer for the industry. Yeah, absolutely. And we keep, you know, the the data explosion is not is not showing any signs of slowing. It's only getting greater. Internet of things. 
and uh, and AI and just the internet in general, we're creating so much more data and the ability, it seems to me to, to, uh, to have that not explode in terms of the size of data centers is just gonna become more and more important as the data gets more and more voluminous, it seems to me. Am I thinking about that right, do you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the appetite for data right now is incredible. And, and the, the amount that it's growing is astronomical. I, I mean, I, I, there is some time ago, they used to talk about um, a, a stat that like 90% of all data was created in the, uh, in the last few years. Um, and, and you're seeing that constantly grow where just, just the amount of data that you hold in your hand on a daily basis is, is incredible. I, I heard a presentation. I don't know if this stat's true. So, you know, just uh, putting that out there, but that if you just took all the cat videos that are on the internet, it would take two nuclear plants just to support the storage of all the cat photos on the internet. So <laughs> true or not, I'm not sure, but if it is, that gives you some context for how much data we're uh, aggregating as a is a civilization, I guess. I, I, I'm going to I'm going to assume that that's true, just because I want it to be true so much. <laughs> uh, um, so James and Kyle, uh, how about some final thoughts here, really quick? Anything you want to leave us with before we go into the Q and A portion of this event? I'm, yeah, I, I would well, just reinforce. Sorry, go ahead, Joe. Go ahead, Kyle. I, I would just you know reinforce a, a couple things. Um, so when you're, when you're thinking about um, citing, um, it, it, you know, there, there's lots of different models that are out there. And, um, you know, our sales team is, is super familiar with, you know, what's currently available. Um, the nice thing about the IntelliScale product is that it can be retrofitted in most of our data centers. Um, so, for example, because we already use water for uh, in a closed loop chilling process, if you need to bring um, liquid to chip that can be done within the existing confines of the data centers. So we're set up for stuff where we are now. And then uh, we're super familiar with checking out um, markets where we don't have a current presence. And so any of the sales folks will be able to help you sort of figure out what, what the best deployment area is. And then, you know, always be thinking about a little bit about balance, right? So, you know, there's a lot of focus on climate out there for, for, for good measure, right? And renewables and carbon, but there are other considerations. We've talked about water, biodiversity, circularity, which include things like recycling, um, green building certifications, which we've committed to doing for all of our new builds, lead in the U.S., BREEAM in Europe. Um, so it's, it, we try to look at uh, both AI and sustainability holistically, and there's always trade-offs um, depending on you know, the decisions that you're making. Right. James, final thoughts from you. Yeah, I, I would say we're, we're, we're in the first inning of this thing um, <laughs> as it relates to densities and data centers and, and driving efficiencies. Um, you know, while, while a lot of us have worked really hard trying to think of, create, design um, the most efficient data centers, you know, we're, we're customer driven for the most part, um, but I think we're, we're just in the beginning of this. And I think what you'll see this, this evolution of the data center industry over the next, I would say even five years, which is an eternity in this world today, but it, it, over the next five years is going to be um, a huge difference from what you're seeing today um, in, in terms of having backup gens on site, the amount that you have, um, you know, UPS, non-UPS, I think all of these things start coming into play and then temperatures rise, you know, the ability to let temperatures rise within a data center so that we can draw the most efficiency out of our systems. Um, I think, I think we are in the first inning of this thing and I think it's just going to keep evolving, um, which is great. And, and, you know, every, as we can make things better, you've got a lot of really smart people out there um, that are driving different things. And, and hopefully we keep seeing that and, and bringing that to the table. Absolutely. Well, Jim and Kyle, I want to thank you so much for being here and for talking about it, just an urgent topic that I don't believe gets enough coverage uh, out there. Um, now, we do have some great questions coming in from the audience, a lot of interest in this. So I think what we're going to do now is uh, is is dive into those questions. So um, thanks again for your uh, for your time today. Thank you. Appreciate it.
Excellent. Thank you. I told you that was going to be an awesome presentation, didn't I? And there's no doubt that it was. I just uh, just enjoyed that so much. It is something that that needs to be emphasized more that that we all need to pay more attention to, I think. So um, given that uh, and given the great questions that are coming in, I think we are about to to, uh, to dive into some of those. Um, Kyle and Jim are on the line and we're going to be joined by Cyrus One's Fred Holloway for this too. So we've got, we've got a big gang on for this. Gentlemen, if you're all ready to go, the first question that I have here is for Kyle today. Uh, and this has to do with um, a little bit more about the company itself, about Cyrus One. So the question is, um, what were Cyrus One's key priorities in kicking off its sustainability initiatives? Hey, th thanks for the question. Appreciate it. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. You sound great. All right. Fantastic. So I think one of the biggest challenges with sustainability and then, of course, AI uh, made everything a little bit more complicated in some ways is to try to figure out what to focus on. So within Cyrus One scheme, we sort of focus mm -hmm. the world of sustainability on four different areas. So those are climate, water, biodiversity and circularity. And what you find is doing better in some areas can oftentimes sort of offset or cause you to do less well in others. Um, so AI kind of adds a, a layer of complexity into that mix in that um, it makes some things easier to do, like site selection, and then can make other things more challenging to do, like uh, power concentration within the data centers. All right. And there's a follow up to that uh, also, Kyle. Now that AI is being adopted by so many enterprises, how has this impacted uh, Cyrus One? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I'll give you one example, and uh, it was it was in the, uh, the presentation that we gave, but I think it's so important because it really uh, allows us a lot of uh, flexibility. So when you're in a co-location space, what that means is that uh, we're not deploying our own um, IT assets, right? So we're, we're basically um, providing uh, housing for others. We, we're highly dependent on where customers um want to or need to locate. And historically that's been close to like population centers. And so there tends to be this concept of data gravity, right? Where a lot of people wanna all be in the same area. And so that tends to be where we um, have to site um, to be able to meet customer needs. So AI gives us the, the flexibility, at least in some instances to decouple the, the availability zone or, or, or where the, uh, the training takes place from where the processing takes place. And so what that means is it allows us flexibility in siting so we can move away from some of those availability zones, bringing sort of less power density, um, less less water draw, at least as it applies to um, in a concentrated area. So you can go where there's more renewables, as we talked about earlier, where water is more plentiful or where there's less impact on biodiversity. Okay, excellent. Uh, Jim, got one for you now. Um, during our discussion, you had mentioned the idea of intelligent uh, power management, and we we discussed that at, at some length. So, uh, as a as a little bit more detail to that, what would you say are some best practices for intelligent power management? Yeah, so <clears throat> we're starting to see, and not even so, it's it's evolving just like every other technology and everything else is in this world. Um, you know, the, the more granular we can get um, from from measuring and, and calculating, um, the better off, you know, better off we'll be as far as efficiencies and, and whatnot. So I think um, some of the best practices that we, you know, we try to do a couple things. We, we do predict, predictive modeling out of the gate just to make sure that, you know, what we're doing, first off, uh, will work because um, that's pretty important, you know, and, and to Kyle, you know, Kyle had mentioned, you know, the co-location world, it's, it's not always one person in a data hall. So we have to understand that, you know, how one customer coming in affects the other. So, so knowing and being able to measure these things, um, you know, using some, some more of the intelligent management um, tools that we have available helps us, you, you know, design this thing better out of the gate and then, even more so from an operation standpoint, manage it better, you know, day two uh, for, for everybody's sake in the data center. 
Right. So it's it's really just it's it's granularity. You know, that we just keep getting a little bit better with this, with this stuff and, and being able to run these models and, and be more predictive. I think that's where it, it ends up. And those those little steps end up uh, becoming big leaps ultimately, you know, don't they? When you when you add them up. Um, great stuff there. Uh, Fred, I have one for you. Um, someone wants to know what is the key driver or a key driver for deciding whether to upgrade an existing data center or to build a new one? Now, I assume this is in the context of sustainability goals. Well, it can be, uh, Keith, thank you. But the, the Traditionally, what the, one of the key drivers has been the, um, the willingness or eagerness of, of companies to uh, invest capital dollars to, into refreshing their infrastructure uh, or looking at, at spending or transitioning to more of an operational expense. The, um, and, and there are a lot of sustainability issues with that with new generations of of generators of, of all the equipment that goes into building a data center that'll be resilient enough to uh, to support the load in the event of, of an outage. But the but increasingly, what we're seeing now, along with many other industries, is that the the supply chain pressures that have impacted our industry, like so many others, is one of the real key ingredients. While they're um, while we've seen some kind of alleviation or, or reduction in the in the pressure on supply chain, we're now purchasing uh, equipment to support future builds out about two years. And some of the long lead times that we're dealing with for generators and other equipment are almost out to two years. So it's a combination of things. There are new technologies out there, which quite frankly are not less expensive that will address a, a more sustainable build. But the reality is just being able to acquire this equipment is becoming more and more challenging. For sure, yeah, excellent. Um, Jim, so question for you. Uh, how large a role does sustainability play in how companies look to design future data centers? So for, for years, I mean, <laughs> We, we always, well, we like to say we focused on sustainability. Um, nowhere near what we, we do these days. So the, the future of data center design is, is really heavily focused on sustainability. And, and some of that even breaks down into, you know, not, not only being good citizens of, of, of earth, but, but also there's, there's financial benefits in the form of financing. Right. So so that that comes into play. So it is really, really um, important. It's it's a big impact these days. So, you know, and, and it's almost like once you start going down this path, it, you, you do get to a world where it's like, all right, well, I can make this little change and, and that helps this. And I make this tweak over here and that that helps that. So um, you start tying the financials to that and, and know that there's there there are definitely ROIs I, I, when you look at these things. Um, so it is a, it is a major focus. We have, um, you know, a couple of people that I've hired recently, that is a passion of theirs and, and they're in the construction design world that, that used to be a mild, you know, they can help out a little bit with that. Well, it's, it's becoming a more of a full-time job. I wouldn't say it's a full-time job on the design side just yet, but, but we think about it with every single design, with every single component, with every stick of conduit or um, sheet of drywall that goes into a, a data center. And I, I mean, I'll take it even one step further. We look at things like, you know, where do we need to seal floors here? Do we not need to seal floors here? What are VOCs looking like? There's, it, it, it's amazing that, you know, when you start peeling this onion, there's so many different layers. Um, that, that you can go down as far as sustainability. And I, it, you know, much like I, my comment earlier that, that I believe we're in the first inning, I think, I think we're, we might not be in the first inning of, of the sustainability uh, part of this, but we're still at early stages and I think it's going to continue to get better. Yeah. And at least we're on the field now, right? I mean, that's, again, as you mentioned, we, we weren't even in the stadium before, so there is some progress to look at. Um, Kyle, so you had mentioned um, 
PUE, CUE, and WUE. So that's carbon power water usage effectiveness. And somebody had a question related to those terms. When thinking about those, what should be the top priority as it relates to data center location? I mean, all of them, right? It, but it really on, it kind of depends on 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 where on. I guess what's important where you're siting. So let me give you just like one brief example. So we have a, a large deployment in, in Chandler, Arizona, right? Which is a which is in Phoenix. And so if you're looking at um, you know what is what is the hardest thing to obtain in that market when it comes to resource the data centers use, you would say that water is. So I, I think. If you're a data center operator and you go into the middle of a desert and you say, hey, I need, I don't know, 20 million gallons of water a month to, to cool my data center, that's probably not a viable market entry strategy. And even if it was, it can cause two things. One is friction with the with the community, right? If there's, if there's already water shortages. And second, um, I think I mentioned this earlier too, there's a little bit of a resiliency risk, right? So what happens if water becomes unavailable? Uh, or pressure drops or those other sorts of things. So in those circumstances, I would say water is king versus uh, if you don't have access to, let's say, carbon free energy, then maybe that becomes your your primary criteria. So I do think uh, it's, it's a little bit of a cop out answer, maybe, but the answer is it depends a little bit. All three are important. So that's yeah, the consultants. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. It's the audience too, right? I mean, it's it's who you're talking to at any given time with this. I mean, I mean, Fred, keep me honest, but you know, if you if you sit in a room with a customer, I I bet PUE would rank maybe highest on that list at, when you're sitting in front of the customer versus you know CUE being um, a little bit different uh, when we're talking to the you know doing financing or, or something along those lines. So I, I think it's the audience. Yeah, that's exactly right, Jim. I mean, we've been talking to customers about the power usage efficiency for the longest time. And that, for those on the audience, just a baseline, that's if you think about the power that is used to power your IT systems, there's some additional power that's required to keep them cool, to keep them at temperature. And that's what that incremental efficiency rating is all about. And if you're going to, if you're paying a dollar for your machines, it's, you know, it's costing you 30 to 50 sense additional to keep them cool <clears throat> and so the closer you can get to 30 or even with some of the recent um, introductions of liquid cooling uh, solutions that you can drive a PUE to a much more efficient level it's only recently that customers are starting to dig into carbon and water efficiencies and and to what Kyle shared earlier um, we have been able to show some real efficiency, some very compelling numbers around water efficiency. And then, of course, as customers look at where they might want to um, um, house their next data center, which markets they might want to select, what types of uh, renewable and sustainable power sources are available to them, that's what often will drive that, that CUE discussion. So it's a combination of things, but you're absolutely right. From a purely practical operational perspective, Jim, it, the, the power is, is where we spend a lot of our time with our, a lot of our conversation with our customers. Right. So, so you're saying I should probably cancel those plans I am creating now for the data center in the Sahara Desert? You think that might be something I, I want to rethink? I'm not sure I, at this point. I don't know. People are putting them in Phoenix. So, I mean, it's, it would seem somewhat crazy at times, but, but we, we still seem to be doing it. And they have all those fancy buildings in, in the desert in, in Las Vegas. So I must be figuring something out. There is an efficiency in the dry air. So there, there is something to be said about that. But, but I think the other key thing with all this stuff is, you know, we, we talk from a design and engineering standpoint about, you know, making these numbers tighter and, and PUE getting tighter. And I think, you know, what would be great is if um, if the consumers would would allow us to raise temperatures in the data centers without, you know, going too crazy. And, and so there are some customers out there that are willing to push, you know, push that a little bit 
more forward. You, you, back in the day, you used to go into a data center and it was, you, you literally, I remember working um, in Chicago, if you, you went walking around in the summer, you know, one of the things you could do after lunch is come in and just go walk into the data center and just stand there and cool off. And it would be, it would be 60, <laughs> minus, you know, 60, yep. 50 some degrees in the data center. Those days are gone, right? But, but they're still nowhere near where, where they really should be. You got manufacturers that are saying that, that, this gear can run at 100 degrees, and and I think we need to get there. We need to get there with um, with conversations, um, looping everybody together, so it's a little bit more holistic. And that is from the guys who design it to the customers to the people who make the servers and storage equipment. Mm -hmm. One hundred percent. So, um, so we got to wrap this up now. Uh, such good information. I have one more question, and I'm going to send this over to Jim. Um, for for those who uh, would like to get started with Cyrus One and take that next step, what do you recommend they do next? Ooh, that next step. Well, depending on who you're talking about, I would say um, from a from a customer standpoint, um, that's that's reach out to Fred and his team. Um, I, my information is is readily available too for anybody who wants to talk about any of this stuff, whether it's coming into a Cyrus One data center or you know some ideas or, or challenges that we've seen. Um, I, you know, I'm I'm happy to answer. Great. So so Fred and his team are standing by basically is the, uh, is the thing. Uh, also, don't forget everyone that there's that great group of handouts um, from Cyrus One. You got a couple more minutes to get those. So make sure you download those for more information. Well, uh, Kyle and Fred and Jim, I want to thank you uh, so much for your time today, for those insights in the Q&A. It was just so much fun to have you on. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. All right, everyone, we are uh, pretty close to wrap now for today. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Um, I sure did. I learned a tremendous amount that I just simply didn't know. And again, this this hasn't been on my radar nearly as high as it should be. And I suspect that's the case for many of us who are in IT or IT adjacent as I am. So I was just had uh, just had such a great time doing that. Um, but before we go today, I do want to give away this gift card as the last order of business. So as I mentioned at the beginning, it's a $250 gift card and you have to be present uh, for the entire event to be eligible. And the winner of this Amazon gift card is Craig Lappin from Illinois. Congratulations to you, Craig. We will be in touch very soon to get you your card. And with that, on behalf of the actual tech media team, I want to thank Cyrus One for making this event possible. I want to thank all of you attendees for being with us, for your great questions and for your interest in this topic. And folks, we are wrapped now. That concludes the event. Have a great rest of your day.